Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Business. Markets have snapped two weeks of gains to end lower today. Realty, consumer durables and energy sectors declined, whereas private banks were marginally up. Alex Matthew with the wrap of all the market action. Well, it was a quiet end to the trading week for the Indian equity markets with uh, markets losing ground across the board. You had the Nifty 50 that dropped about 0.4% and you had the broader markets that underperformed. You had the mid cap and the small cap index losing about 0.9 and 0.8% respectively. Now, most of the selling was in a few pockets, though most sectors ended in the red. You saw the FMCG stocks that underperformed, but you also saw selling in metals as well as public sector banks. Now, banks are going to be in focus uh, over the weekend, of course, because you have five banks that will report their earnings for the second quarter. You have the likes of ICICI Bank as well as Kotak Mahindra Bank, IDBI Bank, RBL and Yes Bank all reporting their numbers on Saturday. Bond yields in the U.S. have remained elevated off late, and in fact, the 10-year a, a treasury yield hit that 5% mark and that is essentially what has uh, resulted in a sell-off in risk assets across the globe. If anything, the Indian equity markets have uh, not fallen to the extent that certain other markets have. Uh, higher bond yields, as you know, uh, prompt a risk-off sentiment generally. Uh, you have uh, a few names that uh, I'd like to mention in the top gainers on the Nifty 50. You have the likes of Kotak Mahindra Bank, as well as Indusin Bank, Tata Consultancy Services, SBI Life, as well as Tata Consumer. Just a little over a dozen gainers, most of them losing ground. And the top losers, of course, were in that FMCG pack that I mentioned, ITC disappointing on the margin front. And in fact, the PAT missing guidance or, or expectations as well. Tata still losing ground and HUL reporting the lowest volume growth in as many as six quarters also underperforming in trade today. Devi's Lab as well as BPCL were the other top losers. Now a few other names that I'll mention from the broader markets. You had Century Textiles that dropped nearly 7% after Q2 loss of about 33 crore rupees. Titagar Wagons gained another 6% in trade today and that's because of another order win. You had United Breweries that gained close to 4% despite a decline in profit in the second quarter. And finally, Indraprastha Gas was one of the biggest losers in trade, losing over 10% on news of the potential adoption of the EV policy in uh, New Delhi for the fleet operators and that is seen as a negative. But all told, it was a quiet end to the trading week. Let's see how we trade at the start of next week. All right, spotlight on the week ahead. Indian markets have fared well in the past three years. Will FIIs continue to invest more in Indian equities? Amit Sajdeva of HSBC Securities shares his insights. Hitherto, China was not quite attractive. The latest data from China is a slightly more attractive number than what people might have thought. If they do indeed turn on the taps of the stimulus, then valuation-wise, it's way more attractive than a lot of markets. And if we consider that if indeed the semiconductor run has a kind of the bottom is reached, then South Korea also kind of comes up in valuation, come maybe growth. Uh, is that a counter to India's attractiveness in the region for global FIs? No, I think this is a very good question because, uh, look, India has been an outperforming market three years in a row, right? In 21, it outperformed. 22, although it was negative, it still outperformed the region. 23, again, it outperformed, although the first quarter was bad. Now, question is that at some level, market would think, let's mean revert. Let's, let's go somewhere else. Why, why one-way street? So there's a short and a long uh, you know, balance to it. But I would probably think that two ways to think about it. That's mm -hmm. if China were to rebound, and given that uh, these relative opportunities are very, very... Uh, you know, good and, and very cheap, then immediate risk would be that some tactical outlook can happen. Doubtless, that's a risk. But question is how deep that could, how sustained that could, right? My sense is uh, India's, teeness, India's rise of structural market is, is probably uh, is more proven rather than in the past because the macro has been stable, growth has been resilient. So I would probably think that if valuation correct a little bit, there's a case for rebound in India back again. So that effect will be short. Second is China obviously is you know recovery path, but there's several still several macro unknowns, and it's still more tactical rather than structural. Right. So so while some True. opportunities may may happen and people may seek, but people have burned fingers 
in in china on the first year and so it would not be uh, too early that entire flows goes back and third uh, india and china for most part of history can actually perform together at the same time they are not zero sum it is not mutual is one or two years that happens because see china for a typical year would attract 100 billion inflows <laughs> india 10 to 15 right now now question is that for china to rise india is not a lone market that can supply all the funding and all those thing it can come from elsewhere as well so put that together risk is there definitely but i would probably think that such a uh, tactical risk would create opportunities for india uh, position to become more valuable and hence this would be very short term All right, a sell-off in the U.S. government bonds has pushed Treasury yields to a 16-year high, up nearly 5 percent. This comes on the back of expectations that interest rates will remain elevated as inflation concerns may continue. There are also fears that the rising bond yields may negatively impact foreign inflows into Indian securities. But RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das says India is well placed to deal with global uncertainties. Let's listen in. i'm referring to bond yields i'm referring to the policy pronouncements which are coming the mixed uh, data points which are coming from various economies the fluctuations in the crude oil prices and the persisting volatility in financial markets globally so what market. kind of impact we expect on Sorry? the indian market financial stability Um, you know, no financial so stability. No, our uh, you see our uh, you see our uh, uh, you see what is uh, what is different in the context of India. Of course, we are impacted by what is happening all over. No doubt on that. But let me. That's not the headline. The headline is that our macroeconomic fundamentals continue to be sound. Our financial sector continues to be sound. Eventually, in these uncertain times, what matters. is how strong are your micro microeconomic fundamentals how strong is your financial sector i think on both the parameters india is well placed bq prime also spoke to richard harris and lakshmi ayer about the impact of treasury yield run up on dollar index and domestic markets and normally you'd expect with such a a bear market in bonds and equities to come off and they haven't um we would expect gold to go up in a, a times of crisis it hasn't so it is a bit of a topsy turvy mood but i think the emerging markets are still highly dependent on what happens in the rest of the world um yes you may have some differentials i mean india of course has, has greatly exceeded uh china's performance in the stock market uh, partly i think because there's been quite a lot of investment there in recent years outsourcing this kind of thing the kind of things that that india does um quite well so i think that really emerging markets uh, and you know let's face it india is 120 odd years old so it's not exactly emerging um but i think that these markets which are so dependent on uh how the western economy goes they will still be following the western economies um and still have the same kind of sentiment attached to it the dollar continues to be a safe haven i think and 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 continues to spike up whenever we have geopolitical risk you know it is even more high frequency than oil in, in that sort of sense and i suspect it will be higher for longer you know when people can put their money in the bank and 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 earn 5% on it that's pretty nice you know at the end of every quarter you've got a reasonable return that's something that uh, should we say younger investors have never experienced um and we have to remember that there's a big part of the investing community out there that wants yield Uh, the relies on on relatively safe returns um so it's not all bad news as we go out of there uh, and clearly while we've got these interest rate differentials there's going to be an attraction of money into the dollar just to pick up those yields so the bond yields already are uh, acting uh, i would say uh, northward in response to two factors one is obviously the us uh, treasury yields heading upward and second more importantly is the expectation of the impending uh, open market bond sales by rbi so i think these are the two factors which still continue to be in the uncertain region however at around the 5ish levels uh, on the us treasury uh, we think that uh, the rates are kind of peaking out because uh, the us housing data is at a 13 14 year low and that is one of the clear barometers of the health of the us economy so i think there about 5 7 basis points so i think us indian yields 
could probably inch uh, closer to the 7.45 region or thereabouts and then just kind of stabilize there as U.S. yields keep gyrating. So it's very important for U.S. yields to hold on for some time now. If you look at it from an Indian investor standpoint, uh, closer to 7.5 to 7.5%, uh, there is a case to add some duration uh, closer to the 10-year bucket. So within the 5 to 10-year bucket, there is a sweet spot. Uh, but clearly, I must tell you that for the foreign investors, uh, given the gap is so narrow, uh, there is still a merit in looking at uh, the U.S. Uh, bonds at the current juncture, given the elevated uh, or the inverted nature there. Uh, also, uh, the up to three-year, four-year segment uh, in the U.S., uh, the sovereign U.S. yields are looking lucrative, even from an Indian investor standpoint, uh, to take some positions. Oil prices extended gains, rising about 1%. The rise was on the back of fears that the Israel-Hamas war may spread in the Middle East and disrupt supplies. Mehika Barve joins us with the details. Brent crude prices rose by 1.17% to $93.46 per barrel on Friday, potentially marking a second consecutive week of gains. These increases are driven by the heightened concerns that the Israel-Hamas conflict could expand in the Middle East, potentially disrupting oil supplies from one of the world's major production regions. WTI prices increased by $1.22 to $90.59 per barrel, and both the November and the December oil contracts are set to record their second weekly gains. All market concerns have escalated following an explosion at Gaza Hospital this week and the expected Israeli ground invasion. The oil price is further bolstered by the expectations of a growing oil deficit in quarter four this calendar year. Top oil producers like Saudi Arabia and Russia have extended their voluntary supply cuts all through 2023 and the U.S. inventories are also at a nine-year low. Additionally, OPEC Plus sources indicate that the temporary suspension of U.S. oil sanctions on OPEC member Venezuela won't require immediate policy changes. They thus anticipate a gradual production recovery to maintain a tight global oil supply due to concerns about a challenging global economic environment and weak demand. All right, now amid global economic headwinds, India has been able to maintain its growth momentum, while IMF expects inflation to come within the target range in 2024, Will continuing external shocks pose an issue? Krishna Srinivasan of IMF shares his insights. India is among the fastest growing economies in the world right now. Uh, relative bright spot, 6.3% this year, 6.3% next year. We revised our projection from April, partly because there was much stronger consumption, much stronger investment. Services exports are doing well. So overall, growth numbers look pretty good for India. Inflation is coming down. The most current reading was... Uh, 5%. So inflation, you know, it had gone up a little bit because of vegetable prices going up and so on, but it's coming down. So we expect, uh, you know, inflation to come down to target in 2024. So in terms of growth and inflation, uh, India is in a re reasonably good spot. Of course, if China slows, the question is, does it affect India? And there I would say the linkages between China and India are not that strong. Uh, I think our trade uh, is about 4% export share. So if China slows, it may not have a material impact on, uh, on India. But there are other factors which could be headwinds to growth. Uh, for example, the external environment, uh, you know, we've had shock after shock after shock. Now the most recent shock, what does that mean for energy prices? What does it mean uh, for uh, demand broadly from the region and the global as well? So those are uh, key, um, what I would call as headwinds. All right, that's all from Let's Talk Business. We'll be back after a short break with more news and updates. 